Okay, so this video we're going to look at the Gaelic Athletic Association. We've done some content on the, the GAA, as it is known, uh, but earlier this year. Um, and Irish history and Irish culture is very, very interesting to me as someone of Irish heritage. Uh, even though I have a British passport and uh, I haven't been to Ireland yet, love to go. Uh, my dad's family, historically, looking back at the family history, came over the Irish Sea and, and settled in Merseyside. So I'm very, very interested in the Irish culture, Irish heritage, and I've done a bit of my family history. It's very, very interesting. Now, the GAA was set up on the 1st of November 1884. I will do a video on the uh, participants of that meeting in the Hayes Hotel. That would be very, very interesting uh, to look at each individual and, and why they met in the Hayes Hotel in 1884 and the foundation of the Gaelic Athletic Association. Now, the, the Gaelic Athletic Association not only... Uh, deals with the governance of Irish sports such as hurling, Gaelic football and Gaelic handball but also other Irish cultural and social pastimes so it's more than just a sporting organisation there's a, there's a lot of there's a bit of politics behind it uh, which can be divisive depending on on your point of view there's a bit of religion behind it as well on a social aspect that is changes are happening there but there's also a social aspect of the community aspect so it's a it is a multifaceted organization and we've looked at as i say at the stadiums they've got some world-class stadiums some of the biggest stadium one of the biggest stadiums in the world croke park is their headquarters so let that sink in and they, they there was there was rule 42 uh, which we're going to discuss and when they had to allow the irish national uh football association and then uh the rugby union to use croke park for their home venue while lansdowne road which is currently known as the aviva for sponsorship was being rebuilt that was a really divisive issue back then it was only about 15 years ago uh but it paid off it was a brave decision for the gaa to take there was some division within the gaa but the Irish football team and the Irish rugby team needed a place to play their home games. And Croke Park was the only suitable venue. It paid off. It really paid off. And this gem of a stadium was exposed to the, the global international sporting fan base, sporting audience. Croke Park is a hidden and underrated gem. It's one of the most beautiful stadiums and historical stadiums in the world. It is a fantastic stadium. It's one of the biggest stadiums in the world. Beautiful. Now... Will the GAA allow professionalism, at least in the sports that it governs? So we're looking at hurling, we're looking at Gaelic football, and to a certain extent Gaelic handball, but the big ones are hurling and Gaelic football, because a lot of Gaelic football players have gone over to Australia to compete in the AFL, which is Australian Rules Football, or the Australian Football League. Now the AFL, um, they get paid a fair bit of money uh, by modern sporting standards. Not the same as association football, or some of the major leagues in the US and Canada. But the AFL, you can earn really good money. And if you're an overseas player, such as a Gaelic football player from Ireland, yeah, you're earning money which you can't earn in Ireland because the sport is officially still classed as amateur. And that's got to be a, 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 an eyebrow raiser that the GAA have got to look at is some of their best Gaelic football players are leaving the GAA sanctioned competitions and going the other side of the world to earn big money. Now, it's not a huge number at the moment, but if the AFL wants to expand and needs players, and there's always that uh, debate around the league expanding and, and sports expanding, and will it dilute the product, will it weaken the product, you're going to need top quality athletes to fill those roster spots if you can't uh, produce them domestically. And the J AFL is looking at adding a 19th and potentially 20th team in their competition. So I, top Irish players may want to, Switch sports, still, still a footballing code, but switch sports play over there. That's got to be something that they've got to look at. You've got hurling, which is similar to lacrosse, is the best way I can describe hurling. That's, that's the closest sport. Maybe bandy, which is a, a Nordic version of hurling. That is the closest you're going to get to what hurling is. So if you're a North American and you play or watch lacrosse, or you, or you uh, currently play lacrosse, or you've, you've got a friend who plays it, that's the best way I can describe hurling, except more brutal. That's it. Lacrosse, the stick has a net on it. Hurling, it's a massive piece of an ash tree that almost looks like a, 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 a pole arm, medieval weapon. And I tell you now, getting twatted with one of them, break your back. Uh, I've got some Irish friends who played hurling, and I tell you now, it, uh, they've shown me some of their hurling gear. It's generally terrifying how little protection hurling players actually have, and the fact they're not getting paid officially for it it's ridiculous Gaelic Campbell 
I don't know enough about Gaelic Campbell to really, uh, like player base and fan base, to to pass comment, and I don't want to pass any, uh, you know, make any comments that are untrue or unfair. But Gaelic football and hurling, I know a fair bit about. I've seen enough footage of Gaelic football and hurling. Um, they are brutal, brutal sports, <laughs> absolutely brutal. These these guys and girls really knock seven bells out of each other. Now. Now that I've discussed the background a little bit, and the, as I say, Gaelic football is, is losing players to the AFL, let's have a look at the history a little bit of the GAA. Covered it before in previous videos, but the 1st of November 1884, there's a meeting in the Hayes Hotel, and it's decided to protect Irish cultural heritage. And this is at a political time of upheaval. Now, I can cover Irish independence and the Irish Republican movement and the, the Ulster, you know, wanting to remain loyalist and uh, Irish home rule and the debate build, in the build up to to World War One and then the aftermath of, of World War One, And Irish politics and, and, and political allegiance shift all the time, historically. So this is not just the Irish hating the British or the English or whatever. The Irish like fighting each other as well, historically. And then we can go back and look at Oliver Cromwell. But the seeds have been sown, especially in the Victorian era, they want Irish home rule. They want Catholic emancipation. So Catholic emancipation is more rights for, for Catholics. And the majority of Ireland is, is Catholic, although there is a fair Protestant minority. So there's a lot of politics and social upheaval at the time under Queen Victoria. And then later on in the First World War, ultimately culminating in the Easter Rising, uh, the Irish War of Independence and Irish Civil War. The GAA is a massive part of that. So there's a lot of social and political upheaval. And they bring in a thing called Rule 42. Now, Rule 42 uh, says garrison games. So that's your rugby union. That's your football. That's your rugby league, cricket. And obviously, more modern times, ice hockey, which the Belfast Giants are the only professional ice hockey team on the island of Ireland. These are called garrison sports, the foreign sports. Basically, the British Army would, would participate in these sports uh, when they're on leave or in their garrisons. They'll organise a game of football. What is very noticeable is these sports are all fully professional or became fully professional around the time or after the time the GAA is set up. Football obviously becomes professional when the Football League and the Football Alliance really get set up and running, but the FA has allowed it to go from amateur to professional status. Uh, rugby League, the reason why Rugby League exists is predominantly played in the north of England. Uh, most of the players had full-time jobs, so basically like the GAA today. And um, obviously, if you got injured, you couldn't work, you couldn't feed your family. So pro professionalism in, in the traditional sense was set up when they split from Rugby Union to form the Northern Union in 1895. Rugby League has been a professional sport since 1895. Association football has been a professional sport since the late uh, 1870s, early 1880s, when the Football League gets set up. The FA Cup is a competition. Uh, rugby Union only turned professional in 1995, but now Ireland is the best nation in the world at Rugby League currently, and they are favourites to win the Rugby World Cup. And for such a small population, they overachieve in Rugby Union, considering there's only, I think, around about five to 600 professional Irish players worldwide who are registered. So for such a small nation, uh, they do produce talent for registered players. Uh, they've got four fantastic provinces in the United Rugby Championship, formerly the Pro League, formerly the Celtic League. Uh, their domestic game and the and the educational side of things, you know, the grassroots is fantastic, considering that the JA is more popular in Ireland. And uh, you just look at the talent they continue to produce off the production line and six, how successful that side has been and how it's unified the nation in a sense of uh, when the financial crash happened. They win the, the Grand Slam in 2009. Look at some of the world class players rugby union had produced. Obviously, cricket now Ireland are now a test nation, which means professional status. And they do play in the county cricket system. They play in the one day system. Um, alongside England and Wales Cricket Board. Uh, again, that's only more of a recent thing that they've reached uh, test status, although they have had professional players. Unfortunately, with cricket, a lot of their best players ended up playing under the ECB for England and Wales. So you can debate that, but cricket has been played in Ireland for a very, very long time, and they have continued to produce quality players. Owen Morgan is, is one that will be the most famous uh, for cricket fans. Uh, and ice hockey, again, more recently, the Belfast Giants is the only professional team, admittedly in Northern Ireland, uh, in uh, ice hockey on the island of Ireland. So these would be classed as the garrison sports, the foreign sports that uh, Rule 42 covers. And so when Croke Park was used as the home ground for the rugby union and football teams when Lansdowne Road was being redeveloped, um, that was a big debate. Rule 42, should it still exist? Should we coexist? Should the GAA, for example, coexist with the foreign sports, which are basically the British sports that the British Army uh, would play? 
uh, and the British settlers who, who came over to Ireland in the build-up to the GAA uh, being founded, they would play the cricket, the, the rug, what was just rugby at the time, that's split into league and union, uh, they would play football, and that was seen as non-Irish. So this is where that protecting traditional values, traditional, tra traditional culture, traditional music comes in. A more modern development, which talking about having winter breaks and mid-season breaks and, and player welfare is the winter training ban brought in in 2007. Coaches have found ways around this, and I will look more into the winter training ban, but that's been brought in to pr protect players from burnout because they're not professional. These are still classed as amateur athletes. And so that is a very interesting subplot. Alongside Rule 42, which, as I've discussed, the winter training ban, and, and is it, it is controversial, and, and coaches, any rule that's put in, Coaches and teams will find ways, loopholes, legal or otherwise, to get round it. So we, we debated, you know, rule breaches, salary cap breaches, therapeutic use exemptions. And in this case, with the winter training ban and teams and coaches are finding workarounds around, you know, the two month stand down period, basically, for, for athletes. They're not allowed to train for two months over the, the depth of winter. It's like December, January time. They're not allowed to train. But. It's a known fact that, well, it's a badly kept secret that head coaches and, uh, you know, uh, uh, attack coaches, for example, or team physios will, will basically call up players and say, here's your training programme, do this. Don't train on club premises, but train at home, but do that because of the amateur status. They're finding workarounds. It's a badly kept secret. Any time a rule like that's placed in where you there's going to be workarounds. But can the GAA continue as an amateur organisation? And the one sport I'm going to discuss is Rugby Union because of the Rugby Union World Cup that is currently taking place. We had this same debate in the late 80s and early 90s uh, because the two World Cups in 87 and 91 that were brought in, there was a big drive to get World Cup status for the sport. And for the most part, the top, t the cl top club teams were pretty much professional in all but name. Uh, Bath Rugby Club, for example. And by 1995, what was the IRB, which is now World Rugby, decided to make the, the top level game professional. And we can debate the pros and cons of professionalism and has it truly worked. And we look at some of the financial issues uh, club teams are finding themselves in. We look at uh, some of the issues international teams find themselves in when it comes to match day payments and investment and closing that gap between tier one and tier two and tier three. And I've debated that. And is it truly working? And back in 2019, obviously, Augustine P. Shot and Bill Beaumont were going for World Rugby's top job. And Bill Beaumont retains his position. And Augustine P. Shot, basically, admittedly, I'm on Augustine P. Shot's side, but he threw his toys out the pram and basically told World Rugby to do one. So we've had the same debate in Rugby Union because of that amateur status and... The wealthier teams, basically, those with bigger fan bases or, or wealthy backers, are basically circumventing the amateur status of the sport. Now, I'm not saying the GAA is this is happening because it's got more of a social and cultural aspect to it. But it's an interesting one. We've had the debate in rugby union. Um, the GAA is more popular on the island of Ireland than the sports that are governed by the GAA than rugby union and football. Um, that's a given. Uh, obviously, the Belfast Giants is the only professional ice hockey team in the island, on the island of Ireland. So the GAA has more teams, more players, fans turn up. Uh, it's a very interesting sport to look at that dynamic. But then you look at the Rule 42. And as long as Rule 42 continues to exist in the Charter and, and going forward, uh, they, they might have to make a further amendment. There are some defunct rules. And there has been some controversy surrounding the political aspect and, and uh, the religious aspect to the GAA and its governance and, and involving the various communities of Ireland. And, and therefore, the big sticking point is Rule 42. And now, obviously, you know, I want to look at, you know, the foundation, the actual foundation in the Hayes Hotel on the 1st of November 1894. That's going to be really interesting to look at all the interesting bigwigs, as I call it, all the, the founders and and. and their motivations behind it and, and and how they came to that meeting. It's going to be very interesting. But then you have to look at the history of uh, Europe in the centuries before 1884 and the politics at the time between the island of Ireland and the rest of what is now the UK, Great Britain, and look at the internal politics and the social 
issues and of course industrialization as well. Ireland is an exceptionally rural country, uh, well Ireland as well, it's exceptionally rural, very few big cities, Dublin and Belfast obviously are the, the, the famous ones, but you've got Limerick, you've got Waterford, you've got Cork, you've got Wexford, but very small villages and, 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 and towns across the country. There's been issues with depopulation and emigration from the island, uh, hence why there's so many more people of Irish heritage uh, overseas than actually on the island itself. 20, is it 20 or 30 million people in the US, something like that, claim Irish heritage through a grandparent or a parent. Uh, there's a fair proportion of um, <clears throat> Irish settlers in Australia and New Zealand. Canada's got a large uh, Irish descended population, obviously in the UK itself on the mainland excluding northern ireland big including my family uh of, of irish heritage so it's a very interesting debate that depopulation that spreading of the irish culture around the world and the internal politics and social upheaval at the time and in following decades all the way up to you know the modern day so the last 140 odd years there's been a lot of, of politics uh, and, and division within irish society at various points um, upheaval uh, and uh, and so it's a very interesting organization and that that amateur status is part of the core values but at some point will rule 42 with the garrison sports and amateur status be be amended to allow professionalism especially in hurling and gaelic hurling and gaelic football because they will lose talent to professional leagues gaelic football already is hurling probably could if lacrosse was to grow in popularity and, and, and become more profitable in North America, for example, because there is professional lacrosse played at a certain level, could Irish athletes who play hurling be enticed over to play lacrosse in Canada and the US, for example? That, that is a, that, that's the issue, I think, is losing their best talent to professional sport but it's an interesting topic um, and, and the GAA is a very interesting organisation that I wish to look at in more detail. Uh, I, I, in the coming months and in the coming years. I, I I always like learning about history and culture of other nations. I have travelled across Europe, so I have, you know, been to many countries, which is a, a massive help when it comes to looking into the history. I was actually born overseas and I've lived overseas, so it's, it's always very, very interesting to look at uh, society and sport from that aspect as well. Look, look at the club histories I've done of football clubs. It's not just British football clubs I've looked at. I've looked at a lot of European clubs because of, you know, being in those countries, traveling in those countries, you know, watching games. So it's always fun to look at uh, another country and its sporting culture. So there we go. Thank you very much for watching. I know this is a longer video than, than my normal content, but it's a very interesting topic and there's a lot to discuss. And I would love to hear from my Irish viewers. I do have a lot of Irish subscribers. My previous GAA content has always uh, created good conversation and positive conversation. And that's something that I think in mainstream society, uh, especially in the mainstream media, we are lacking at the moment. We need to have more positive dialogue between communities and, and nations and, 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 and peoples because mainstream media seems to stoke division and hatred. And that's my view on it. But thank you very much for watching. Uh, place your thoughts in the comments section below and I will have more content for you very, very soon.